to another edition of Truthbox.tv. It's me, Ross Hemsworth, and my guest today is Well Thornhill, who's travelled all the way from Australia to be in uh, Warminster today. So, can I say, stick another couple of tinnies on a barbie there, mate. <laughs> Thanks, pal. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us, w- w- what made you come out to a conference like this? Because that's a long way to travel for an hour or two on stage, isn't it? That's true. Um, I did a talk like this uh, back in Canberra, my hometown in Australia a couple of years ago and the reception was very good and the, the questions afterwards just kept going and going. <laughs> I think it has happened yesterday. Um, and uh, it's been my impression that if we are going to progress to the next stage in science, we have to get the public interested and get the public to understand what's possible. Uh, because there is a, a huge amount of inertia in the established you know, scientific fraternity the politics and everything is is quite arcane and uh, in fact is preventing progress now rather than uh, uh, helping it. Well, let's go back to the beginning, your work, and uh, I must admit I missed your talk yesterday, so I'm a little bit behind, but I heard what you were talking about in the question and answer session yesterday, and it seems fascinating because the whole thing is based around the electric universe, I believe. That's right. Uh, I came to realise after decades of research that um, our science is really... uh, lingering back in the uh, Victorian era and uh, that can be shown by the very fact that in the last 50 years or so there have been no big breakthroughs at all like we had at the beginning of the 20th century and uh, also um, everywhere we look in space uh, with the all of the wonderful spacecraft we've got out there more puzzles arise our science is totally non-predictive it's a case of reacting and uh, trying to patch up old ideas in fact, you can see that because about you know, 97% of the universe is invisible, undetectable, mm-hmm. which is really quite an incredible situation to be in. Mm. Well, I mean, the other night I was watching a documentary on TV and they were showing um, a wind-powered or sun-powered uh, spacecraft as being the only way we can actually get beyond Mars, if you like, and it does seem a bit archaic, doesn't it? Yes, it is. In fact, I've often said that uh, the use of rocket technology in this day and age is uh, sort of brute force and ignorance. Mm. Uh, one of the aspects of the electric universe is that it simplifies things and it's easily understandable. Uh, the most common response to uh, by people uh, in the audience afterwards is uh, you know, it just makes sense. And part of that simplification is to go from all of these forces uh, and scientists seem to be very keen to invent new forces all the time, which only complicates matters. I just say there's only one force, it's the electric force that the electric force can operate far in excess of the speed of light, and there's plenty of proof of that, and that uh, therefore we have the possibility of faster than light travel and uh, also communication faster than light. (coughs) Because when you think about it, on the scale of uh, the universe, the uh, speed of light is a snail's pace. You know, it takes eight and a half minutes for the light to get from the sun to the earth, and uh, the outer planets, it takes hours. So in other words, if uh, the current view was correct and that the speed of light is a limit the outer all the planets are orbiting where the sun isn't you know about a point where the sun is no longer uh, there it's moved on which is uh, an impossible situation in other words uh, Einstein's uh, speed limit introduces a universe which is incoherent uh, can't sustain life Uh, (laughs) in fact it's just impossible now, taking that one stage further, how would you suggest using the electric universe to, say, power a rocket or to power a spaceship to actually move beyond where we are now? Well, I- if you uh, reduce gravity and magnetism to versions of the electric force, then uh, we know that the electric force can repel as well as attract. In other words, gravity, it is possible to uh, invent a, an anti-gravity device, which means that then, uh, once you've done that, you can use the uh, gravitational field of a planet to accelerate you into space. So uh, the savings in uh, fuel and so on <laughs> would be just phenomenal. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned dark matter yesterday, and if I get you right, you don't actually believe dark matter exists, is that right? Yeah, it's quite unnecessary. It's, it's a result of using Newton's laws in a universe where uh, the dominant uh, activity is governed by electrical currents flowing through plasma. Uh, I I have to use the word plasma all the time because um, it's been pointed out that 99.9% of the universe is in the form of plasma, which is matter that's been, um, atoms that have been torn apart 
so that you have negative charged particles and positive charged particles all floating around. When you have that, <coughs> that situation, the uh, <coughs> particles are, uh, the forces on them are dominated by electricity, sorry, <coughs> uh, electrical and magnetic forces. And the, uh, that means that all of our ideas about what governs the movement of uh, galaxies, for instance, galaxies rotate like a solid plate, totally uh, unacceptable from Newton's law, unless you invent dark matter that you can't see and put it in just the right places to make the theory work. Mm -hmm. And this is a characteristic of the way science operates now. The uh, theories are bent out of shape to um, uh, fit the obs observations. Yeah, it sort of makes sense, actually. Now, a lot of um, researchers, uh, for the want of a better word, uh, in the UK are talking now about uh, plasma lights, um, warning of, sort of warning of earthquakes and such like. Yeah. Um, we've also had uh, people like Paul Devereaux, who's a good researcher in the UK, saying for some time that these lights are something to do with the plasma energies around the Earth or in the Earth. We've had now this discovery of things, strange lights above thunderstorms and weird goings-on, if you like. Do you think these weird goings-on are all explained by the Electric Universe theory? Yes, they are. In fact, uh, we predicted some of these things uh, before they were found. And uh, certainly in the case of earthquakes and volcanoes, uh, the Earth itself is an electrified body, and we sort of live on it like birds perched on a high-voltage wire without realising what's going on underneath our feet. And so when there's uh, electrical disturbances inside the Earth, you can actually have uh, thunderbolts inside the Earth or lightning and the rumble of thunder. Well, the rumble is actually the earthquake. And uh, <coughs> because this is an electrical event, it also involves uh, lights above the ground, all these strange lights that have been reported. And uh, they've just recently discovered from spacecraft that current flows to and from the ionosphere above an area which is just about to... Uh, experience an earthquake so the possibility of earthquake prediction in the future is quite good that's fantastic now what do you think of Nic Nikola Tesla and uh, the alleged Philadelphia experiment I don't know uh, enough about that to be able to comment on you know <laughs> uh, the reports but um, Nikola Tesla from all of the published material of uh, his experiments and so on was obviously an electrical genius he had an intuitive sense of uh, the electrical nature of the earth I think and, uh, of course, invented a whole lot of things that we use today, but he doesn't get credit for. You know, like AC power and AC motors and all this kind of thing. Yeah, so he's uh, unrecognised, I think, possibly because he was pushing the boundaries too much for those around him to uh, actually stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he could be right. Now, where does the future lead with this? I mean, is science now taking you seriously and sort of saying this is something we should be looking at, or do you still find yourself sort of hitting your head against a brick wall at the moment? No, I feel quite confident. Um, I received an award this year from an independent scientific organisation whose uh, reason for existence is uh, a return to truth in science because they feel that we've really lost our way. And so to receive an award from them, an international award, was uh, very, very nice. Uh, more and more engineers and scientists are joining uh, the efforts that we're d uh, making to publicise this. And uh, hopefully someday, somewhere with the courage in the media, we'll pick it up because uh, this is the science of the future. There's no two ways about it. And is there a website people can go to to find out more about the work you're doing? Yes, there is. Uh, Electric-universe.info will get you there. And uh, there's a, a, another website in America uh, called thunderbolts.info, uh, which has uh, pictures of the day. Uh, related to the electric universe and a lot of people uh, apparently get up and have that with their morning coffee they uh, it's a uh, an attempt to show people an alternative to the standard view because there's an uh, astronomy picture of the day we get more hits than the official one now. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Now, just one final question. Um, I'm quite into looking at a website called spaceweather.com, which mm. gives us warning of things like coronal mass ejections, this sort of thing from the sun. Now, there's an awful lot of, um, if you want, want to use the word bullshit, going around about 2012 right now. Yeah. Uh, but NASA are predicting perhaps the highest rate of solar flare activity uh, around that period. What's your view on this with regards to the connection to the electric universe? Well, certainly the uh, sun's uh, uh, activity influences the Earth's weather and climate. And this is a factor that's not uh, put into any of these global warming calculations. 
the uh, currently science doesn't understand the sun. It's as simple as that. So any predictions they make about what the sun will do in the future, you can take with a grain of salt. Uh, and as for 2012, all of these uh, doomsday scenarios, in my opinion, are, are harking back to uh, a prehistoric memory of doomsday, you know, fear of the end of the world. And this is a recurring fear that mankind goes through. It's like you've got to go through it and then you have a catharsis when nothing happens. But as soon as that's over, somebody starts another one. Uh, so all of it is a case of looking over our shoulder at the past, but we don't actually understand that yet. When we do, maybe we'll heal from it. <laughs> and just to finish, how long do you think it'll be before we are venturing beyond Mars with main, manned spacecraft? Uh, I don't think it will be all that long once we understand the universe better than we do now. And uh, I don't know, some people say that you've got to wait for the old ideas to die out, but I hope that's not the case. And I think if the public begin to realise just how simple and compelling the uh, this vision of the electric universe is, they will uh, com they will actually force the governments to stop spending money on wasteful projects like they do at present. And then we may see the future come more quickly. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for taking the time out today from what is obviously a busy schedule and uh, have a good flight back to Australia. Yeah, thanks very much.